Welcome to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We are here each week to help you lead more confidently and make a bigger difference, both professionally and personally. This episode is brought to you by Kevin's Daily Newsletter. The Daily Newsletter is a short email delivered Monday through Friday, written to inspire, engage, and focus you on becoming the best person and leader you can be. Learn more and sign up at remarkablepodcast.com forward slash daily. And now here's your host, Kevin. Welcome everybody to another live with Kevin, another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Um, you know, I have a couple of questions for you before we actually get started. Would you like to make a bigger impact in the world around you? Would you like to know what it takes to set impact players apart from everybody else? And would you like to develop impact players as a leader? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. Welcome to a live episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. If you're here live, we are so glad that you're here. You can start by saying hello and telling us where you're from. We'd love to know that. We'll share that with everybody. And while you're here, uh, imagine that you're joining us for a cup of coffee. Share your questions, your comments, your ideas. They'll make for a better conversation and eventually for a better podcast episode too. And if you're not here live, you could be in the future. You could get all future live episodes and therefore interact with me and our guests uh, by joining our Facebook or LinkedIn groups, you can go to remarkablepodcast.com slash LinkedIn or remarkablepodcast.com slash Facebook to join us for that. Uh, today's episode is brought to you by Remarkable Masterclasses. Each month, we release a new skill in the, in an advanced masterclass format. I'm finishing this month's today, designed to help you become the remarkable leader and human you were born to be. Details on how to get on board for a specific skill or get discounts each month can be found at RemarkableMasterClass.com. Now, I think most of you who are here know who my guest is today. You've probably heard of and certainly likely read some of her stuff. Her name is Liz Wiseman. She is right there. She's smiling and waving at you. Let me tell you about Liz, and then we'll dive in. Liz Wiseman is a researcher and executive advisor who teaches leadership to executives around the world. She is an author of four books, including the New York Times bestseller, Multipliers, How to Make, excuse me, How the Best Leaders Make Everyone Smarter, and her latest, Impact Players, How to Take the Lead, Play Bigger, and Multiply Your Impact. She is the CEO of the Wiseman Group, a leadership research and development firm headquartered in Silicon Valley, California. Some of her recent clients include, you've heard of these companies, AT&T, Apple, Disney, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Nike, Tesla, I could go on. She has been listed by the Thinkers 50 ratings as one of the top 10 leadership thinkers in the world. She previously worked at Oracle, both as the global leader for human resource development and as vice president of Oracle University. She holds a master's, excuse me, a bachelor's in business management and a master's of organizational behavior from Brigham Young. And right now, She's our guest, and we're so glad that she is here. Liz, welcome. Kevin, it's so good to be here. Thank you for inviting me into this conversation. It is my pleasure. And again, I hope all of you, we know there's a bit of a, of a lag here as you're joining us. So if you uh, are just now here and you want to say hello, please do and tell us where you're watching and listening from. We'd be thrilled if you'd do that. So Liz, uh we had a very brief chat before we went live and I showed you my copy of the book and you saw all these notes in here, which means that I, we could talk for like three hours, uh, but we don't have that long. So I've selected some stuff for us to chat about. Um, but I really want to start with a place I start with a lot of people. Um, I get the chance to bring people here who are, who are high impact players actually. And um, it, it's always, I think, instructive to learn a little bit about how you got here. You spent time at Oracle. You ended up uh, starting your own firm, doing the work that you do. Tell us a little bit about your journey. Oh, well, you know, I started, I, I, it's been like 30 years that I've been in the workforce and I'm, I'm kind of finally coming back to what I, I started wanting to do. It's like that, um, is it a T.S. Eliot? Like, and this is the end of all journey to come back to where you started and know the place for the first time. You know, um, I came out of graduate school, like 
rearing to go like teach leadership. Like somehow I knew that was like the thing I wanted to do. And I tried to get a job working for Zanger Miller, which was um, kind of the premier management training firm. Yeah. And, and you remember at night, like somehow wiggled my way into an interview with Ed Musselwhite, the president of the company. And I kind of like announced, I'm here. I want to work for you. I want to teach management. And Ed, sweet man, he looked at my resume. He's like, well, you want to teach people how to lead. Maybe you should go get some leadership experience. And I'm thinking, wow, how short-sighted, you know, of him. Like how he doesn't get me. <laughs> of him. I think... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like, why wouldn't he want me to come work for him? Hello. Like, I want to do this. I'm passionate about it. And and so then I took this backup job, which was a great job, but I wanted to go teach management. And then I went to work for Oracle, was thrown into management, and then spent the next 17 years managing. and got some amazing experience. And now, you know, I left Oracle and started doing some coaching and research and writing and teaching. And I'm kind of on this research, write, teach, repeat cycle. And today I'm, I'm teaching people how to manage, but I've actually gone through the journeying of figuring out how to do that. And Ed Musselwhite, of course, was so right. And I was so wrong about this. But of course, I just wanted to jump in and start doing it. And I think a lot of people make this mistake. My impact is bigger today because I went out and served and, yeah. in a leadership role and got beat up and had to make hard decisions and had my heart broken when I had to like lay off a hundred people one day. And yeah. So now, Liz, there are people coming to you, someone's going to come to you someday and you're going to have that experience on the opposite side. I'm ready to come to work for you, Liz. Here I am. And, and you'll, you, you may have to have that same conversation with someone else um, in the future. Maybe you've already had that conversation. Yeah. Well, I, I, I have had to steer people towards like, go do the work before teaching. And, you know, honestly today I can see people who have taken the shortcut and, I wanted to take the shortcut. If someone had let me do it, I would have done it. Um, yep. I well, there's, there's, you know, shortcuts are, it depends on what we're talking about, right? In this particular case, it's interesting that you say all that, Liz, because when people introduce me, I'm getting ready to do stuff, you know, a lot of times now it's virtual and they'll usually introduce me by saying some of the kinds of things that I said about you. And then I'll say the most important thing to know about me is that I'm leading every single day. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and, and so hopefully that makes me way better. Uh, at what this is that that we both do for a living. So, um, so tell us about the new uh, book. Really, I don't. I, I, we'll have plenty of time to talk about the book. I really want you to tell me what the big idea of this book is, because it's a different kind of book than what you've done before in many ways. Um, well, it, what's it, the big it, idea of Impact Players? I think the big idea is that there are a lot of really smart, capable, hardworking people who aren't having an impact. And there are other people who are equally, or I should say no smarter, no more capable, no more hardworking, but yet they're having an extraordinary impact. And so it's not about how much talent we bring to the equation. I think it's about where we focus our energy and our effort and the mindset that we bring, not the talent or intellect that we bring to a job. I think that might be one of the big ideas. Yeah, I, I really love that difference. And I think the longer that I'm alive, how about that? Uh, which is, look at the color. Uh, it's a long time. Um, is that, well, my, my yours getting colored. Mine's just, this is just what you got, right? Um, uh, is that mindset is, I think, more important than, than I think most people give it credit for. And, you know, I think that, that has been a consistent part, I think, of your work, at least from my perspective. Um, and, and so... Maybe we'll just jump here. I've got way more questions than we have time for. Let me just say this. So, okay, if the book is about the mindset of impact players, who are they? Like, okay. who are the people? How do we know if we've got one? Like, who are they? Oh, you know what? This one's funny. People just know who they are. Like, um, you know, so impact players, it, it's a metaphor that I borrow from the sports world. And they're about these like kind of like standout contributors who, you know, like in the sports world, they, they play well, they, you know, they have talent, 
but it's the people that we turn to in the most critical moments. You know, they're clutch players. They're the people that you hand the ball off to who, you know, you know what, this person's going to make the play, not just because they're talented, but because they're paying attention. They understand the gravity of the moment. They understand how critical this is. And they're not a ball hog. They're, and that was one of the things that was so delightful about these impact players. First of all, managers knew instantly who they were. So the essence of the research was, you know, my team and I asked 170 managers, tell me about someone who's like smart, talented, capable, hardworking, who's doing well versus someone who's smart, capable, hardworking, who's making an extraordinary impact. And they're like, oh, Sunir, oh, Kevin, oh, you know, right. you know, Sarah. It's like, they know who these people are because we know who, who the people that we can not only kind of pass like a do a no look pass to we know that these are people that once we pass something to them we can kind of forget about it because it's as good as done and they're like what is it that they do differently than other equally capable people and that was the fun of the research is finding out what is it like how do they think about their job differently what how do they approach things differently um what do they do differently than everyone else? So my job was to like build the anatomy of like the profile of the people everyone knew about. Yeah. So, I mean, I, th that was sort of a strange way for me to ask the question, but I, I, it, that, I wanted to ask that because I want to get to these, what you call the five practices in a second, but I want to make an aside. So uh, there are the, the whole book is not, is not sports at all. But there are sporting there are sporting analogies throughout it. So for some people, that's really really good news because they're sports fans. And for other people who aren't, I don't. I, it's I think important for you to know, and I'm I'm speaking for you now, Liz, uh, that that it's not overwhelming by any means. And I wouldn't want anyone to be put off by it. But I think it makes an important point because there are some things about that I think sports fans are not that we can learn from what uh, what happens in sports that, that yeah. can help us in many ways, right? I'm guessing you made a very conscious decision to use those analogies and metaphors throughout. Well, you know, and I'm not a huge sports fan. Like I've been to so many sporting events, but it's because I got like a ton of kids. And so it's like, you know, I'm like an involuntary sports spectator, you know? And, uh, <laughs> and, you know, in some ways I, I get so distracted because because I can't really watch the game, even my kids playing, because I'm so interested in what's happening on the sidelines, the coaching that's going on. is Usually I'm watching the coaches. But um, I, I think the sports world is an interesting one because there's such clear standards of winning and excellence. And so like the, there's interesting metaphors to borrow. I don't think you need to know anything um, about sports to be able to process this book. Yeah, I com I completely agree. I, I just felt like I wanted to say that because I appreciate you saying it because I often find that, you know, that I, I if, if I'm teaching a group, I'll, I'll, I'll say, oh, after like two, okay, no more sports metaphors, right? Because I know that not everyone loves that, but I don't think there's too much here at all. And I think that there, you know, we could probably have a whole conversation about that, uh, the, the validity and the value of the connection between sports mm -hmm. and the business world or organizational life. Uh, that's not really what we're going to do. Um, we are going to talk about impact players in general. And you mentioned it already that there are some things that they think about differently and do differently. Uh, and you identified it as five practices. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to have you tell us the five practices very, very briefly. And again, they're, they're pretty clear and they'll make sense uh, to people and then what I want to do, my goal is to ask you questions, Liz, that no one else is asking you. Oh, that's good. Right. So what I'm going to do is ask some things in each of the practices after we go through them briefly and, and just sort of like toss some things out that you bring up that I think are interesting and are in, 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 in and a part of the practices. Oh, being okay. the practices themselves. So first of all, lay out the five practices. These are the things, you know, who those impact players are. What are the things that it that make them so? Well, I, I, let me start with a backdrop to these five practices. These are not just five practices. They're five situations that impact players handle very differently than ordinary contributors, people who are capable and smart. And, and all of them have to do with ambiguity and uncertainty. So the first is how they deal with messy problems. Most people tend to 
do their job. And people said they did their job. They did it well. But when problems are messy and sort of out there in no man's land, what the impact players do is they don't just do their job. They do their, the job that needs to be done. They venture out. They're rangy. The second is how they deal with unclear roles where you're collaborating, but it's just not entirely clear who's in charge or situations that someone needs to step up and be in charge. And, you know, most people don't want to make a land grab. They don't want to just assume leadership. They wait for direction. They wait for someone to ask them to lead. They wait for an invitation, whereas the impact players, they kind of step up and lead before they're asked without being asked. And they step up, which isn't, I think, all that novel that people who are really impactful step up and lead. But they don't just step up. They also step back with the same grace, the same energy that they stepped up with. Like they follow others as easily as they lead others. The third practice is how they deal with unforeseen obstacles where uh, something unreasonable kind of drops in their way. Like we're like, I couldn't have planned for this. It's completely out of my control. It's just like a zinger. And most people in those situations, they escalate up. Whereas the impact players get the job done. They cross the finish line. They've got a completion gene and they, they don't necessarily cross it alone, bearing all this burden themselves. They get others involved, but what they don't do is they don't let go of ownership. And um, the fourth is how they deal with um, moving targets where the situation is changing, needs are changing, you know, wicked problems are changing faster than we can solve them. And most people try to stay focused in this situation. They try to minimize and manage change and stick to what they do best, stick to their, they, they, in some ways they play to their strengths. Whereas the impact players don't play to their strengths, they're constantly adjusting and adapting themselves to fit the environment and not just doing what they, not just responding to feedback they've been given, but asking for it. Essentially like they're asking, where am I off track and how do I get back on track? And then the last thing is how they deal with just workload and unrelenting workload. When it just feels like there's more work than you can possibly do, most people look for help. They carry their weight, but when it's unreasonable, they look to their leaders for help. Whereas the impact players make work light for everyone. They make hard work easy. So for all of you keeping track at home, your program are, are the five things are make yourself useful, step up and step back. I want to get to that in a few minutes. Uh, finish strong, ask and adjust and make work light. That's where you ended. So if those are the five, um, I struggle with how to ask this next question. Liz. And so I don't know that the way I came up with asking it is best. Um, but I, I know as the author, I can't ask you, which is your favorite. Uh, I'm not going to ask you, which is your favorite. I, I'm going to maybe what I wrote down here to put on the screen says, which one has the greatest leverage, but maybe what I'm going to ask is this instead, hmm. answer that if you wish, but I'll ask a different, slightly different question. Which one is most misunderstood or misapplied? Uh, probably the first one, and it's probably why I put it first, this idea of make yourself useful. I think the world is telling people right now, hey, be passionate about something. Find your passion and like go pursue your passion. And I don't know, maybe this is a little too autobiographical for me, but I started this way too. Like, hey, this is what I want to do. Hey, Ed, hire me. Hire me, hire me. And I'm ready to put me in, coach. Put me in, coach. Like, this is the position I want to play as opposed to, coach, where am I needed? And the people who say to their coach, put me in where I am needed, are the people that become extraordinarily impactful. And I learned this lesson. I mean, it radically shaped my work experience and my career and the trajectory of my career. You know, I'm now can't get Ed Musselwhite to hire me. So now I go work for Oracle and I'm like, I'm on the lookout for a job, a chance to do some management training inside of Oracle. It's a young growing company. We've got tons of technical training and I have this opportunity to go work for this company, uh, the, this department inside of the company that does technical boot camps. But I'm like, oh yeah, I think their charter's going to expand. The company's growing really fast. Like it's either going to naturally expand and include management training, or I will do some fast talking and convince people that we need to do this and they should let me do it. And I attempt this during the interview with the VP of the group. 
And I'm like, you know what? Blah, blah, blah. Oracle needs a management boot camp. And like, hey, put me in, coach. And, and his response was priceless. Because he said, Liz, you, that's great. We think you're great. And I agree. You know what? There's a lot of people who don't have management training wreaking havoc on, on the organization. He said, but actually your boss has a different problem. She's got to figure out how to get 2,000 new college graduates up to speed in Oracle technology over the next year. And what would be great, Liz, is if you could help her do that. I'm like, that's not the job I want. Like, I have no passion for correlated subqueries and like, you know, database indexing techniques. Like, get someone else to do that job. I want to teach leadership. And, you know, Bob wants me to teach programming to a bunch of nerds. And I'm not a programmer. And I'm not a programmer. I'm actually not even qualified remotely to do this job, but I could, I don't know what it was, but I could sense he was telling me something important. Like he was giving me intel. And I'm like, oh, I get it. What he's saying is this is the important problem, Liz. And like contribute here, please. He was saying, make yourself useful. Yeah, and one of my favorite stories in the book, I, I it, when he says your boss Liz, your boss has a different problem. I, I just, I just loved it. I, I think it's so right. Now, as a boss, sometimes I would like my folks to understand the problem, but, the, but, but I love it because, and I'm, I'm really glad that you picked this as the one for us to, to dive into more, because I do think there's a big um, problem with the passion scenario, right? And I think that the two stories that you've now shared with us lay it out so well. Um, now I just, I just really, really appreciate all of that. I mean, think about it from like just a simple experience. This is one where it kind of gets me is where like, maybe I'm hosting a party and I've got a bunch of people coming over and one of my family members or friends comes over early and there's that friend who's like, Hey, um, how can I help? And you're like, um, they're like, and imagine the friend who's like, you know what? I'm like really passionate about like infused waters and lemonades like what if I did all this and you're like that's not the menu like I don't have the ingredients for that like okay. and, and right now I just need to have clean plates like that's not the biggest important problem it's not the problem and they're like but you know what I saw this amazing thing on Pinterest and like I know how to do this and like we could put some spearmint into this and I'm like ah you know people are coming over in five minutes versus the friend who comes over and says Liz what needs to be done do you need chairs set up oh the table's not like, let me make myself useful. And we all know like viscerally the reaction to these two different helpers and one is not helping. And, and it's the reaction that managers have. Like when we work passionately on what's important to the organization, we end up serving where we're most useful. I find that just serving where we're useful brings a certain joy in and of itself. But people are like, well, wait a minute, but that's not what I want to do in the world. That's not what I want to do with my life. It's like, nobody's asking you to sort of like be subservient and to, to never have an opinion or a voice or a passion about something. But what I find is that when you serve where you're needed, when you make yourself useful, like you deliver value and people recognize that, and then you start getting bigger responsibilities and pretty soon you're now in a position of influence and authority. And you can, like by working on the right agenda, you then earn the right to help set the agenda. Yeah. And I tell you like later, they then like, okay, great. You did that. Now we want you to be in charge of the group. Now we want you to like, what do you want to do? I'm like, I think we actually need management training. Good. Here's your funding blank check. And I was able to do work with extraordinary impact because I first figured out what was important to the business, the mission of the organization. And I think this is one that does have huge leverage. And I think, Kevin, I think I worry about all the people who are coming out of college being told like, follow your passion, which is great in terms of choosing a path in life or choosing a company or starting a company. But when you join an organization. Purpose before passion is what I would say purpose yeah and and you will find your greatest impact there you'll probably get your greatest recognition there you might find your greatest joy in purposeful based service and contribution 
And oh, by the way, you might find your passion along the way, as it turns out. So, so I want to go back to. I love this. I, mean, I love the the example of the friend coming over before the party. Like I really love that. Um, and, and there's something that you said. Actually, before we do that, we had someone, and I'm going to pull it back up. Someone said, "I need." Marina said, "What are the five? Make yourself useful. Yes. Step up and step back. Yes. Finish strong." Marina number three ask and adjust number four and then last one is make work light those are the five uh and so but what i want to do is I, we're not going to get to all of them I, I just know we won't liz but i, I want to go to a couple of these and i want to ask you a couple of more specific questions and in the section about making yourself useful and it relates to this example that you just gave about the party right mm -hmm. You, you use a phrase called upward empathy. And I, I want us to talk about that for two reasons. One is I think the example you just used can connect to it very, very well. The other reason I want to use it is that I, I, I think one of, the, one of the good things that comes out of a pandemic is that many leaders have figured out that they need to be more empathetic. Mm -hmm. with leaders. Not all of us, not everyone's figured it out. Many have. And I hope that we hold on to that lesson long past whenever this is all over. Uh, but you bring up this idea of being empathetic upward. Can you talk about that a little bit more? And maybe you can use the example of the the friend coming to your house as a part of it. Yeah, you know, Kevin, I'm glad you asked about it. And it is one of the ideas that I have been surprised that people grab to because in some ways it's nothing. Upward empathy like, is about just being empathetic. It's just being empathetic to our bosses. See, because most of us think empathy is supposed to be extended sort of out and down. Like parents should be empathetic to the challenges their kids face. Um, you know, we should be, managers should be empathetic to the challenges of working remotely. And I've spent the last 15 years helping managers be more empathetic, seeing the capability of others, seeing the needs of others. Yes, 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 yes. We need all of that. But sometimes we forget to extend empathy upward to our leaders because we think, ah, their life is easy. They have it all. They got the power. They got the resources. They got the fancy car. Like they've got everything. But what I learned, and I think it was being thrown into management early and working with senior executives and coaching executives, they have a hard job. They have a really hard job. And most of them aren't jerks on purpose. Like there's a lot of jerks. There's a lot of brilliant jerks. But, but there's no more jerks in the leadership realm than there are in the rest of the world, right? <laughs> there are jerks everywhere. No, it's that... They are trying to do a good job, but it's it's lonely. Um, you know, they make bad decisions often because people don't tell them the truth. Like they have pressures bearing down on them and it's coming from all directions. And upward empathy is really about looking to your leaders or your leader or your client. And instead of saying, what an idiot idea. It's, hmm, I wonder what is hard about their job. I wonder why... They've asked me to do that. I wonder why they're micromanaging me. Is it that they don't trust me or is that someone's micromanaging them? What are the pressures bearing down on them? You know, it would be coming over to someone's house and saying, okay, let me stop and assess the situation. They're panicking. Like I remember once going to a birthday party, our kids were little and I was going to someone else's kids eight-year-old birthday party and she is like a hot mess like running around and my first reaction was why is she giving everyone who's coming to the party things to do like shouldn't she have done that and then I stepped back and said wow what would it be like to have all these people coming over and you're not ready like what can I do to help her get ready and I reoriented like extending that empathy to the person who maybe is supposed to be hosting you yeah. And, and even if maybe she should have had that stuff done, the bottom line is now she doesn't. Yeah. And trust me, there are leaders saying, I wish I had that figured out. I wish I could have been better prepared for that. And if we're willing to look up rather than just, you know, expect it to show up, it, it will change everything. And and the other interesting thing that I loved about the, the example of the party is, would we love to have someone show up and say, how can I help? Absolutely. Would we love to have someone show up, look around and see that tables need chairs, right? And almost just say, 
do you need help with the chairs or whatever? Like there's this other level of, of, of empathy that's beyond just asking the question because the question still requires me to, (laughs) what should I give them as opposed to that next level? And it's, it's, I think such an important point. Go ahead. Well, and I think about how many times I've offered to people like, oh, what can I do to help? And in some ways I've just added to their burden because now they're looking for a helper job for me. Like, okay, let's give something to Liz, like to, you know, make her feel important or useful versus hey, I noticed that the chairs are out but haven't been set up. Can I do that? Or just to do it and then say, by the way, I set them up. If If this isn't how you want them, tell me what you want different, right? Tell me what you want different. And so like taking that back into the work realm, like um, one of my favorite parts of the research was asking 170 managers, what is it people do that you kind of hate? What are your pet peeves? And what are the things that people do that you absolutely love? And what comes up really high on that list of things that people love, I think it might be the highest. I'm going to look here. I've got to consult like the official source to make sure. Um, Number one on the list of things bosses love that are credibility builders. When we do this, we build credibility with our customers. Our bosses is doing things without being asked. You know, and I hear sometimes people say, oh man, if I did that, I'd get my hand slapped. I'd be in so much trouble. Most bosses don't like being bossy and it's an absolute gift. You're saying, you know what? I oh, uh, also number two on this same list, anticipating problems and having a plan to solve them. Like, Oh, you know what? I think we're going to run out of chairs. We're going to kind of push this party metaphor a little bit yeah, why not? Right. We started yeah. um, on this. It's like, you know what? I think we're going to run out of chairs. Um, you know what? I've gone outside and pulled some chairs off the deck. Would that be useful? Like, Oh my goodness. Thank you. Yeah. One of my favorite examples of this was Evan Hung at Target. He would ask his boss, like, what are the questions your boss is asking you about in one-on-ones? Like he learned her job. She was the head of um, risk management. And so it's like trying to understand just what is it like to be you and what is it that you have to do and how can I help you be successful at that? Mary Abijay, who was, who's been on the show, I don't know if you, Liz, if you don't know Mary, you would love her. Um, she wrote the book called Managing Up. And in Managing Up, she talks mm-hmm. about the idea of understand your boss's goals, which is another way of saying what we're saying right here, right? Like if I understand what their objectives and goals are, then I'm able to be more helpful. I'm also able to put the stuff that I want in better context. It takes us all the way back to your comment, like Liz, the boss has got a different problem right? Yeah. Like once I understand the boss's problem, it puts me in a whole different space. Um, I, I would love to ask a question about all of these uh, areas now, but, and, and like I said, I want to ask stuff no one else is asking, but then of course I asked about upward empathy and apparently I'm not the only one. Uh, so I'm going to skip all the way to making work light. And, mm-hmm. and, and one of the suggestions that you make there is this idea of playing your chips lightly. Uh, let's talk about that. I, I, I absolutely agree with the idea, but again, I love the metaphor. So talk about this idea of now, remember everybody, this is in the making work light piece. We're all busy. We all got a million things to go on going on. Like what, what do you mean by playing your chips lightly? Oh my gosh. Again, I cannot come up with something someone hasn't already asked you. No, I just have these. Um, I, this is something I've been teaching managers to do for years. It's like, you know, there's a lot of managers who are playing way too many chips. Like, oh, gee, no one else comes up with ideas in the meeting. Well, there's no time to, to wedge an idea in there because most managers are taking up too much. They're doing time. all the talking. And, and so it's, it's a metaphor that I've been using for years, which is just like, be smart about how you play your chips. And Bosses generally need to play fewer chips to allow their team members to play more. But when we look at what the most impactful team members do at all levels is they're really smart about how they play their chips and they're going to dispense a lot of idea and opinion, but do it in a small dose. And one of the things, when we step back from this, we found that the impact players, they make work light for other people. And there's several ways that you can do it. One is being easy to work with. You know, most of us have a workload and then we have a phantom workload, which is 
like all the things about work that make work hard, like people issues and drama and politics, like the impact players don't, they don't contribute to that workload. They just don't do that kind of work. It was one of the things in our survey that they almost are always never did, never got involved in any of that. And they're low maintenance. They're the kind of people who would, if they're going to send you a long chain of emails to say like, hey, what do you think we should do? They're not going to just say, what would you think we should do? They're going to say the following emails, because they've already taken time to read it all. And they're like, the following emails make these three points. Do you think we should do A or B? And, you know, when people read it, they're like, oh. so they're light, they're low maintenance. And they're the kind of people that would go into a meeting aware that everything they say is like playing a chip. And they're, they're going to play chips where they have a unique point of view, where they're making a contribution that is relevant. Like they're not like, oh, I know this is a tangent, but I just have to tell you this story. It's like, oh, I just got tired hearing that. And why? Like, that's not about us. That's about you. You've got to be very clear, right? Like, so it's playing your chips carefully, intentionally, right? In ways that are evidence-based, um, you know, and these are all things that build their credibility, which is why they have so much influence. But, you know, it's one of the things that both leaders and contributors at all levels, we can be more aware of, like, how are we playing our chips? Well, there's a little thing in the book, like some common fails, like things that we tend to do that add no value. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we probably can't have this conversation at this stage in the world when we're still figuring out what the future of work is going to look like. Mm -hmm. And for many months now, most, many people, certainly not all, but many people have been working at a distance. So what would you say, this is the phrase I'm using all the time, the long distance difference. What, what would you say mm -hmm. we need to keep in mind specifically if we are wanting to be a, a high impact player? What do we need to keep in mind and think about differently, perhaps, if we're doing it at a distance from those we work with? Mm. And Kevin, do you, when you say the long distance difference, do you mean what do we need to do differently when we're working at a, yes. a far distance? Yeah, that's what I mean. Yep. Yeah. Well, first of all, when we are remote, it's so easy for us to get out of touch. Like it's so easy to do work remotely. What's hard to do is fill in all the little um, interstitial space, all of the like subtleties, because like figuring out to your point, Mary Abergé, you know, her point about figure out what your boss's objectives are. Well, my, my experience is the things that are important to our bosses, our clients, to those we work for, those are rarely written down. It's rarely like, oh, let me send you a PowerPoint that articulates everything I value and is important to me. Like, those are things we have to listen to and pay attention to. And when we're working remotely, sometimes we miss some of that context and that subtext, and we have to make sure that we get access to it. When we're on a hybrid team, it's very easy for the people who work remotely to go unseen. Like they're not the ones we turn to right away because it's easier to just turn to someone who may actually be less capable but they're right here. I can see them. It's I easy. See their eyeballs. And so I can hand things to them. And so we have to work harder to connect with those who are remote. Here's what I think the big issue is. And, and like behind this is this notion. I actually, something I feel very strongly about is that, you know, we're in a burnout epidemic right now. And most organizations are responding to that by saying, oh, people are working too hard. Let's take our foot off the, the accelerator Let's back away. The workload's a problem. From everything I've studied, I come to the conclusion, a different conclusion. And that is that burnout is not the function of too much work. Burnout is, is more often than not the function of too little impact. That people are working hard, but not seeing how their work is making a difference. Now, when we work at a distance, it breaks these chain reactions of impact like we send our work off into the ether and we don't know where did it go? It might be that I sent like, Kevin, you might be my boss. I send you a report, it's got all this analysis and you're like, oh, that's exactly what I need. Liz Wiseman, she's the best. 
and then you go do what you need to do with it. And maybe you never stop to say, oh, by the way, Liz, that report was exactly what I needed. And it helped us make this decision. And that decision, like if we were working side by side, you'd just yell over, you know, to my cubicle or the next, hey, Liz, boom, you hit it. Like, Killer or drive. when you saw me at the when you saw me at or when I see you at the water cooler or walk into the parking lot or any of a hundred other places, none of which are happening when you're at a different place than me. And I think this is one of the things that we are missing right now that is hurting us is that people aren't getting that casual chain reaction of you did this, it had a positive impact, and we get these kind of feel good moments. And it's one of the things that managers can do like right now to help restore this is to help people see where their work is going. You did this. I was able to do this. She was able to do that. We won because of this thing you did. Taking us back to purpose and meaning, which is one of the things we started out with early on. So uh, Liz, I have a couple more questions for you as we yeah. start to wrap up and uh, I'm going to shift gears, right? Uh, the question is, Liz, what do you do for fun? Ooh. I really am not very fun. Um, let me see. I hike. I mean, I do that for restore restoration. Um, yesterday I did a fun thing and I got my son a slack line, a one inch slack line for his birthday and he's like mom do you want to do it my reaction was uh no i definitely don't want to do that but i went out and for fun went out and kind of learned to slack line a little bit with him and um his girlfriend said wow you're like the coolest mom ever that was fun yeah which was more fun being on the slack line or getting that feedback we'll we, we'll we'll let everyone decide that for themselves oh no i was a sucker for that feedback i'm like <laughs> what was that can you say that again i didn't hear you the first time it has now been documented right you've now cool. said it to all of us mom um, ever so, so um the only question i told you that i was going to ask you is this next one so what is it that you're reading these days or what's something you've read recently liz you know, I read so many workbooks, but here's the one that I started reading, um, and I'm going to pick back up. It's my reward reading for having finished this book is See No Stranger. And uh, it's just, it's absolutely gorgeous. Like seeing humanity in every single person that we meet. See No Stranger. And yeah, I think it's about restoring a, a lot of broken connections um, that seem to be plaguing us right now. Perfect. Uh, what else? Where do you want to point people? How do people can how can people connect to you? Where can they get the book? What do you want to tell people while I hold this book up with all these post notes in it? Um, where do you want to point people, Liz? Well, um, the book is available in uh, lots of places. All the online retailers like a Amazon and Barnes and Noble, and I've seen it in some bookstores. People are sending me pictures, little reconnaissance work that is out in bookstores. You can get information about the book at impactplayersbook.com. And here's what I'll tell you about the book is, you know, it's just been out for a couple weeks. So you don't really know what it is until you kind of see it develop some legs and things. But as I was working on it and getting ready to release it, I've had two thoughts about it. Like I have days where I was like, wow, I think this is a really valuable book. I think it's really important. I think it's going to help a lot of people. I'm proud of this book. And then I have the same number of days where I'm like, this is the dumbest book in the whole world. This is such a stupid book. And <laughs> I'm like, it feels obvious. Uh, and people tell oh, me. Whoa, 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 let me stop you right there. Okay. So everybody, uh, you need to go get a copy of this book. I'm just going to tell you all, you need to get a copy of this book, Impact impactplayersbook.com. Uh, let me just say this. There, it seems obvious to you, Liz, because you're one of those people. That's why. And I've been doing the research for two years. And so it just gets under your skin. And, and it seems obvious to you. And sometimes, and there will be pieces of it, I think, as a reader, that you'll say, oh, yeah, yeah. Of course. Of course. But, you know, common sense isn't always common practice. And there's way more than just common sense here, although there is a bit of that. And I certainly understand that point of 
man, this all is obvious to me because I've been living with it and I've been studying it and I've been doing it and all those things. And yet, so I'm going to, I'm going to speak into that yin and yang of this is really going to be helpful and this is really dumb and vote on the helpful side. How about that? Well, thank you. Um, and I think other people have said that, but you know, you don't know if it's covered. So I'll let the reader decide, but yeah, there are days where I think, no, there, I think this is a very valuable message. And it is what I found in the research studying 170 of these super high impact value contributing high influence kind of professionals. And, you know, they're not necessarily any smarter than anyone else. They're not necessarily more capable than anyone else. They're not necessarily, they were kind of as a bunch, pretty hardworking, but they weren't necessarily working harder than others. Right. And they aren't, I can't even say they were working smarter because that sounds like it's somehow like productivity hacks. It's that they had a different way of thinking about work. Yep. So now I have a question for all of you and a final, com actually a comment before my question. And that is we, the last two chapters of the book, we didn't talk about at all, two or three chapters, which is all about how, as a leader. And in fact, I think I even teased this and we never got here, right? As a leader, what can we do to develop these folks, develop these mindsets in our folks? And that's all super valuable, but I made the choice to stay with us and how do these mindsets impact us? And so my question for all of you, it's a question I ask you every single week. And that is now what, what, what are you going to do with this? What insights do you get from this that you will go apply? Because it's one thing to say, well, that's interesting. It's another thing to say, well, I'm going to go do that. Maybe I'm going to think about how I play my chips. Maybe I'm going to think differently about empathy because even if I'm a leader and I'm working at being empathetic downward to use Liz's point, uh, I also still have a boss. And so how do I think about upward empathy. Those are just two examples, two of the things I wrote down, but the real challenge here for all of you is to answer that question. What am I going to do differently as a result of being here, along with, of course, buying a copy of this book? So um, before we go, let me just remind you all that we're here every single week. And uh, if you're watching live, we'll be here same bat time, same bat channel next week. <laughs> and if you're listening on the podcast, come back again. We'll be back again for another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast.